Loved what they did between the third and fourth quarters here. They played the uh, um, some Animal House music. Otis Day and the Knights. And yeah. uh, shout. everybody would shout. Thank you. Everybody was on their feet and having a big time. It was, uh, it was fun. First of all, we talked about body language and attitude. This is Quinn Blanding, one of the defensive leaders for the Cavs, speaking to the offense who's lined up on the sideline waiting to go in during that last timeout. Yeah, and I don't think he's given up. I'm sure he's going to make sure his teammates don't either. So, Mike, we were talking about Oregon. You as head coach here uh, went 116 and 55. So almost 70% of your games you won here uh, over the 14 years you were the head coach, plus the other time you spent as an assistant under Rich Rich Brooks and, uh, and here at Oregon. You helped build this program into what it was. Now we turn around, and this period of time later, expectations on Mark Helfrich. We had four losses last season. Ooh. <laughs> you know, and, and so are the expectations fair? I, I don't I don't know if they're fair. They've risen because of success, and you create your own expectations. Uh, if you don't go to a BCS game or a national playoff game now, fans are disappointed, and yeah. that's okay because yeah. when you set their sights high, I think as coaches and players, we all want to play in the best games and win every game that we play. But the reality is you can't and don't, and oftentimes you have to take sometimes the good with the bad. But I think Mark Elfers is doing a great job. I think he's hiring the right people and doing it the right way. Can they be better? Absolutely. That's why he made a change on defense. He has a wealth of talent on offense. He found a quarterback from another school, Dakota Puka, for the second year in a row, brought in somebody that's going to make this program better. So I think the expectations, he is part of the, the group that built those expectations. You're talking about, I get just those gaudy numbers that you achieved coaching this team, yet there was a point you had to do as you were telling us the story, and I want you to tell the story, you had to have an intervention with your team. What in the world? <laughs> well, that started after the Las Vegas Bowl in, uh, I think, 2006. And we were beat soundly by BYU and a Bronco men at home coach team. And it, I just never felt like we recovered from that. I didn't recover. As a, we were outcoached, outplayed. And the energy that we demonstrated on the sideline was not what I wanted. So we needed to do something. So what'd you do? <laughs> well, I decided to have an intervention. I actually, John Neal, who's on the staff still, said, you know, Bronco had done something when he had some issues. He... He kidnapped the team, so I did that basically same thing. I had buses pull up. I told the team to report at 7 p.m. to the uh, CAS Center or whatever it was, and we booked them out to Camp Harlow. And we took them and started at 7 p.m. Uh, we did a lot of soul searching. What we did basically was put stuff up on the wall and say, okay, this is what we liked about the program, wrote it down. This is what we didn't like about the program wrote it down so we, and then we had I had the players write me a letter what they like what they didn't like and if they didn't like something how could we fix it yep. so we agreed upon certain solutions and at the end of that thing we took what we liked and we kept it we took the solution list and we kept it we burnt the things we didn't like we threw it in the fire it was a pyre bonfire type thing and said we got rid of that stuff and it broke down the barriers Coaches talk to coaches, coaches talk to players. Everybody held themselves responsible. So now you flip that back to Bronco Mendenhall, who is very creative and has worked very hard since taking over this Virginia program at team building, tearing down the culture that uh, that was there and trying to build it in and mold it into the culture that it needs to be in order to win. And, and does it happen overnight? No. It's going to take some time. But it takes effort. It takes a bounce of the ball, a little bit of luck. It takes coming back and winning a game you might not or should not be able to win. But it takes the energy and the commitment of the players and the coaches in the program. So we're talking about Bronco Mendenhall and trying to rebuild the culture uh, of this team. One of the things he thought was a great advantage to him in doing that is he brought almost his entire staff from BYU intact with him to Charlottesville. He said, we know what the message is and we have a consistency of message because we've done it together in Provo. Well, that's sort of a neat thing. I think that that proves how much they like and trust Bronco Mendenhall and believe in what he's espousing. And you're right, hearing the same message from every coach on the staff early after retrained coaches makes Bronco's job easier, too. One of the things I forgot to mention, and maybe the most important things coming out of the intervention, yes, one yes. was the win the day motto that we yeah. created during that meeting at Camp Harlow. Chip Kelly made the comment, we had this team pledge, and he said, well, can we whittle that thing down? It makes it more sense. And he came up with the I win the day, and we accepted that that night as our motto going forward. 2007 a season, nine wins and a bowl victory, a number two ranking that we lost, unfortunately, when Dennis Stixon went down. And then a 10 victory season in 2008 with a bull victory over Oklahoma State. So there were some positives came out of it. I think it helped to refresh our organization.
And that win the day, tracing it all the way back, basically inspired by Bronco Mendenhall and something that went back to John Neal's time with Bronco. Uh, That's back true. Over the Duck years. Nation or Duck fans may not want to give yes. him credit, but he does he does deserve it.